And people you didn't used to take guitar seriously, but now they do. And now there are so many great players and it's all because of what he did. And we should never forget that. I still think that, you know, guitarists can think more like Segovia in a musical way. When he played, it touched your heart. Uh, when I play, I want to touch people's hearts. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a bunch of notes. Welcome to the Acoustic Guitar Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined today by a special co-host, Blair Jackson, who, among many other music journalism credits, is the former editor of Classical Guitar Magazine. For this episode, we explore the legacy of Segovia through conversations with his students. Andres Segovia was born February 21st, 1893. To mark what would have been his 130th birthday, we spoke with three contemporary guitarists who each studied with the maestro, Lily Afshar, Leona Boyd, and Michael Chapdelaine. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast is listener-supported. If you learn something new here, please consider making a contribution by visiting patreon.com slash acoustic-guitar-plus, or check the show notes for more information, plus additional resources about Segovia and our guests. And to those of you who already support the show, thank you so much. We cannot do this without you. Segovia called himself quote, the apostle of the guitar, and dedicated his life to the mission of bringing the instrument out of parlors and into concert halls. He was a virtuosic player, an exacting teacher, and inspired and influenced many composers, luthiers, publishers, educators, and audiences the world over. If you play the guitar today, classical or not, you too have been touched by Segovia in some way. For this episode, we discuss a more interpersonal side of the maestro, You'll hear about his interactions with Lily Afshar, Leona Boyd, and Michael Chapdelaine. Each of them had a unique experience, one of which lives in infamy, and each shares their perspective on how playing for Segovia when they were students impacts the way they see music today. If you aren't familiar with our illustrious guests, here are some brief introductions. Leona Boyd was one of the most popular classical guitarists to emerge during the 1970s and 80s, and her albums crossed over to pop audiences. Michael Chapdelaine is the only guitarist to take first prize both in major classical and steel string guitar competition. Lily Afshar is perhaps the most famous guitarist to emerge from Iran, and though she is extremely well-versed in the foundational pieces of classical guitar repertoire, she has also explored the traditional music forms of her native country. Both Afshar and Chapdelaine were selected to perform for Segovia at his 1986 USC Masterclass. Our episode begins with Afshar's reflections of her time with the maestro. I had done many master classes, but I had never done one with Segovia. So that made it so special. And uh, we were, the performers were seated on the stage. And the audience, of course, was out there. And there were TV cameras everywhere. And it was like a, really a performance uh, that was to be uh, broadcast every night. I mean, it wasn't just a master class. It was a big event, you know. To it uh, with a lot of prior knowledge of, of Segovia. You said that you listened to his records when you were growing up. And also you had studied with Oscar Gilia, um, who was a, a real student of Segovia's. Uh, how, how did that help you? It helped a lot. Having studied with Gilia helped a lot because Gilia t- made me sing. He made me sing. I give him credit for that. I mean, he was like, Lily, you need to sing. And he would take me on a walk and make me sing and conduct my pieces. Because at first I was so shy and gosh, I wasn't going to sing, you know, especially in front of the teacher. But no, he, he broke that barrier for me. And Segovia sings. I mean, he sang in the class every time he, he, he didn't play the guitar in the class. But every time he wanted to uh, bring up a point, 
he would sing and he would sing with such emotion and passion. It was beautiful. So I, I was on the same line. I understood what he was saying. Another thing I understood is, uh, you know, I speak five languages and <laughs> he would switch from English to French to Spanish. <laughs> and, and quick, quick, quick. And many people were lost. You know, they would look at him like, what did you just say? But I could follow. So that helped me a lot, too. Is it intimidating to play pieces that, that he made famous? No, I did not feel intimidated one bit because I felt like I was meeting my grandfather again or it's like it's like, or an old friend. I mean, I grew up with Segovia long distance, of course, but... I was, it was just natural, you know, for me. It was really natural. And I felt very comfortable playing for him. I mean, I had practiced so much. I knew my pieces in forward, backward, you know. Uh, and uh, I was just listening to and watching him, very responsive to whatever his reaction would be. And I would adjust right away to whatever he wanted me to do. I had all that control so I could change things quickly. And that's something I got from Gilia too, because he would just change a fingering right there in the lesson. And I had to learn it right there. This is a kind of a two-part question. Immediately after your lessons, um, what were your takeaways then? And then what kind of has stuck with you throughout your career from the, that master class sessions? Basically, uh, he would slow uh, the tempos down, you know, and I was always, like when I was playing the grand solo of Soar, bam, bada, bam, bada, hey, hey, where are you going? He said. <laughs> right, he, he, he actually stops you and slows you down. Yeah. yeah, he slowed me down to practice tempo. So it was easy, you know, I had practiced it at many different tempos, so. It was easy for me, but then I would get back to my original tempo in the middle of it and he'd go along with it. Uh, but basically he really wanted us to, to sing and play music, think of phrases and be a musician. And that's what the main lesson was. It wasn't technique, you know, because I had the technique. It wasn't that. Yeah, a lot of it seems to be dynamics. Dynamics, tempo, rhythm. Yeah. He, he, he didn't want me to rush. You know, he thought I was rushing in Sarabande, for example. I'll never forget those lessons. They were just so special. Uh, and uh, just playing for him was just incredible. Sitting next to him. <laughs> and then at the end, you know, he would hold my hand for a long time and not let go. <laughs> and his hands felt like pillows. It was really it was like a pillow. It was so soft and cushy, it felt great. <laughs> well, he's, uh, he's had so, uh, so much influence in the guitar world, uh, not just classical. I mean, it, it's, you could see it everywhere. Um, wh but what do you see as his, his lasting influence? on the guitar world. If it weren't for Segovia and his importance, where he put the guitar on the concert stage on par with the violin and piano, you know, he raised the level so high and got composers to write for him and worked so hard on elevating the status of the classical guitar that it became so important as that can be taught now in colleges and universities and people can get degrees in it, even doctorates. And uh, that's, I would say, a very important <laughs> a contribution that he, he made. And people didn't used to take guitar seriously, but now they do. And now there are so many great players and it's all because of what he did. And we should never forget that. I still think that, you know, guitarists can, Think more like Segovia in a musical way, not just fingers. Oh, play fast, play fast. No, 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 no. You got to do the phrasing, the singing, 
all of that. And that's what I teach here at this University of Memphis. When he played, it touched your heart. And I want to be touched by somebody's playing. Uh, when I play, I want to touch people's hearts. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a bunch of notes. To me, that's his contribution. I just love him. That's all I can say. <laughs> Next, we talked with Michael Chapdelaine and Leona Boyd about their experiences with Segovia. Well, I never took any formal lessons from Andre Segovia. He was one of my gods, of course. Every time he came to Toronto or New York, if possible, I'd go to see him like we all did, thinking it would be the last time. Uh, I, I first played for him, uh, I think it was around 1970, at the Toronto Guitar Society at a reception. And, um, and then I played for him again when in New York uh, around 1980. Um, but he was, you know, I had so many albums of his. He was just one of my role models. I didn't know a lot about his life, quite honestly. And I was kind of discouraged from stud studying with him way back then. I decided to study with Lagoya just because I heard he had a really bad temper sometimes and would tell students off, especially if they uh, didn't follow his method exactly. And um, I remember one time at this reception after we'd all heard him play and the poor man was probably tired, my guitar teacher, Ellie Kastner, insisted that uh, Segovia listened to some of his prized students. So there was another girl who played first and she did about three pieces, I think. Then came my turn and I played Madronios. Do you remember that piece? I used to love it. I recorded it once. I played Madronios that he loved and then I played Castelnuovo Tedesco against my better instinct because I thought that's enough, you know. Poor man wants to eat from the buffet. And uh, he started getting red in the face and shaking and got his cane, you know, his famous cane, and uh, stormed out of the room. And then later said she's playing far too fast and changed all my fingerings. So um, I got in trouble. But then when he returned after about 20 minutes, and everybody was very nervous, um, he, he just settled down. And years later, we laughed about it. But the time, uh, I'll just show you quickly, he wrote a beautiful quote for me that I could use because I was at the beginning of my career can you read that if I hold it up oh you've got a you've got it framed handwritten yeah so to the Leona the Leona of the guitar um, who by her talent and her beauty will conquer the public philharmonic or not I thought that was very insightful of him he sort of had a must have had a suspicion that I wasn't going to purely stick to the classical guitar world. Boy, was he right. And uh, Michael, can you tell us about your time with Segovia? Uh, it seems to be almost legend. I mean, you probably have already heard the story, but it's, most everybody's seen the videos. Uh, a much different experience in my life than in Leona's. I became a classical guitarist when I got to college. I was an electric guitarist before that. And I ended up liking it very much, but I didn't know much about Segovia. My parents had records, but I didn't like them because I didn't really care about classical music until I came to college. And then suddenly it completely conquered me in a minute. And so Segovia was, of course, the most important figure in our, in our field. And... I figured I would never study with him because he was a thousand years old when I first learned to read music. <laughs> and then he lived, you know, he lived forever. He lived to be 93 or so. And uh, I've been accused of causing his death, but I, I think it's overstated. In 1986, uh, USC had the Segovia master class and, and I applied to be in it and I got in it. I truly did respect him of course i respect him more now because i've come to know that his contribution wasn't so much of his playing i mean he played great but lots of people played really play great but he inspired so many wonderful works by composers that he really is about as important a guitarist as ever lived i didn't care about segovia when i went to the class i only went for one reason 
we all went for the same reason. We went to get one of those letters. <laughs> That's funny. We did it for John Williams and Segovia said that God had laid a finger on his brow and it wouldn't be long until his name was spoken in kitchens and throughout the world. And, you know, in those days, you you had a career because you did several things. You had to get your buttons punched, punched your ticket punched. You, you needed to win a classical guitar competition or some kind of music competition. You needed to have a degree from a reputable institution. You need to have some reviews from major uh, periodicals. And if you really wanted to make it, you needed the stamp of excellence from Maestro Segovia. Believe it or not, I never used that. I only put it in my book many, many decades later. Um, I guess I did get a nice quote from Christopher Parkening, and I, I think I used that in one of the press kits. But, uh, so he gave you a nice quote? Yeah, he gave me a nice quote. He threw me out of class in front of 3,000 people in three. See, that's why I didn't study with him. Lagoya was much kinder. <laughs> the class was uh, two weeks long at USC in 1986. And the first lesson was fabulous. Uh, the second lesson was, yeah, it's okay. I, I played Ponce uh, the first two lessons. And then one of the players played Mallorca in the class, and he loved it. And I thought, whoa, I know that piece. I'm going to play that in my next lesson instead of Ponce. And uh, Jim Smith, the creator of the class. Oh, Pastor, dear Jim Smith. I miss him so much. He was wonderful. Wonderful guy. He made it pretty clear to us that there's a couple things you can't you don't do in a Segovia class. One is don't throw up. And the other one is don't change his fingerings. I changed them all. And I I really was, I was a young man. And I thought this in my brain. I thought, I don't play like Segovia at all. I don't care about Segovia's playing at all. But I think when I play for him, he'll say, you know, Micah, I have played the guitar for 700 years, but I like the way you play it better. It's totally reasonable expectation, right? <laughs> so the, 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 the thing is well recorded. I mean, there's videos that anybody can see and probably most people have. And he stopped me, he stopped me. And then he said to me, you bring me this transcription, my transcription. He says, but you change all the fingerings. Why do you do that? That's the point where you're supposed to like say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know what I was doing. And I said, I, I said, honestly, because I, I did respect him very much, I still do. I said, this is just decisions that I made. And he had a microphone, a lapel microphone, and it was this giant hall, like 3,000 seats. And he went, mm. <laughs> and it echoed throughout the world. And then he said, it's fine, it's for you, you play some more. So I played some more and he said, he threw the music or he whacked it with his hand and he said, but you change all my fingerings. Why do you do it? Do you think what you do is better than what I did? And I said, no. He said, then why do you do it? And I said, rather emphatically, I said, because it's good. And then he threw me out of class. And that was the end of my career. Oh, dear. I loved Mallorca. I played that on my live in Tokyo album. But no, he was old school, you know. We have to understand that, Look at looking back. He was brilliant, and everything he did was fantastic, and I was too young to really understand that. It was, it was a tragedy. Did you know where he was coming from in terms of where he had gotten sort of his technique? I mean... You know, we often hear about the Segovia studies, which are actually the Fernando Sor studies, of course. Um, so he was sort of going back to the source in a way. And did you feel in your own guitar education that you needed to do what Segovia had done? You know, my, my teacher at Florida State University was, was Bruce Holzman, who teaches there still. And he taught us all from the book of Segovia. I mean, we all learned to play lots of restro a very deviated right hand. We all played just like Segovia, lots of rubato. 
and lots of fingering up the neck. And this was like four years after I'd finished my studies with Bruce. And I decided that I didn't want to do it that way anymore. So I, I knew where he was coming from and I forgot. And I, I forgot that, that I wasn't the greatest guitarist on earth. Because at 26, that's what you think. Hmm. So I, I knew where he was coming from. So, Leona, when you played for Segovia, did he give you feedback or was it just a performance? I did get tips. I don't mean to say I just played for him. He actually helped me. He gave me some of his scores and, you know, adjusted my fingers. Uh, but I chose to play pieces that he didn't record when I, when I met him the second time in New York. I remember I played in my transcription of uh, Eric Satie's Gymnopody because I knew he hadn't done that. And I think I did. Uh, I might have played some of English Sweet, Jack DeWart. Of course, that was written for him. But I, don't, I can't remember exactly, but I played something that I knew he couldn't fault me for. So I guess in retrospect, that was the best. Don't play, any, don't play Castelnau Tedesco and don't you dare do it at twice the speed. <laughs> Both Segovia and... Uh, Julian Bream said, wow, you can sure play fast. I think I played them both at Colibri, which I could play like the wind. <laughs> Scovey didn't squeak as much as Bream, and he didn't pull as many faces. What characters all these guitarists were? It sounds like you had, you both had just brief um, experiences with Segovia. Uh, Segovia. Um, what were the, the takeaways immediately after, and then Looking back, what do you see as the takeaways now? You, you, would you like to answer first, Michael? I don't want to keep jumping in. Well, I mean, I, I have a fairly unusual Segovia history. It's usually having study with Segovia is a really good thing for your career. And nothing except my own suicide could have been worse for my career than studying with Segovia. You know, in those days, there was nothing more important for a classical guitarist than to have a good relationship with Segovia. And mine was mine was the worst one that ever existed. And it was, by the way, recorded on three PBS cameras. And so this, this kind of shame thing happened. But for years, the, uh, it, it turned out the documentary that the producer was going to make about this class got shelved because Segovia died and his wife wouldn't give them the rights to to make the documentary they had they had made it but they couldn't publish it and so in those days of course there was no video there was no internet but there was a lot of telephone calls and letters and everybody in the world knew that this uh, arrogant snob from New Mexico had gone to Zakovia class with the intention of pissing him off. That really was the story. And there was no internet to refute that with. There was only the grapevine of people calling each other and meeting each other in conferences. And so I got this reputation of being somebody who'd gone to offend Segovia. It just wasn't true. I mean, I did offend him. That's a, that's a fact, but I didn't go with that intention. And so it was, you know, it was until the internet happened that those films got out and people actually saw that there was this really humble young man who didn't want Segovia to be angry and got thrown out of class anyway. But it did end my career. I'm sure you weren't the only one he threw out of class, though. I think the most famous one. Oh, I got to look it up on the internet. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> no, Segovia was was when he's one of your idols. You know, I used to remember his his photo was on the back of the Augustine strings. That's right. I was used to have that stuck on the back of my books, and I had pictures of him on the wall. And every night, well, I was also crazy about Rudolf Nureyev, the ballet dancer. So I'd I'd kiss Nureyev good night. I'd give Segovia a kiss. My sister would kiss all the horses on the wall. <laughs> so we were just kids. I mean, I'd, this was when I was about 14. Uh, so it's just a, such a thrill to have met him and then to have played for him. And at one point, I thought he was coming to, when I was playing myself, I was playing town hall. 
um, the promoter had said, and Segovia had said he might uh, show up. I was petrified. I was getting so nervous that he might be sitting there in the front row. So I was greatly relieved when he wasn't there. But then that's when I met with him the next day. And he was very kind and uh, did give me quite a few tips. So, you know, it just, he must have had an off day when, when you came along and played Mallorca. When, when somebody is, is as influential as he was, both in terms of the repertoire that he chose to play, which influenced everyone, and the way he played, which obviously influenced a lot of people, does it then become hard to establish your own style? Uh, to to break away, maybe like the way Michael did, and say, well, I don't really like his fingerings. You know, I, I'm going to choose my own my own path on this kind of thing. Is Michael was that harder for you once you had had that rejection to keep going with your own views of, of how to how to do things? When I played for Segovia, I was really interested in clarity and simplicity, and so where he would finger it up here, I would finger it down here. And really, did he influence me? He was the catalyst for my teacher, Bruce Holzman, who was in town during the class. I called him up after the third, the third lesson was when he threw me out of class. And I immediately went to Jim Smith, the promoter, the producer of the class, and said, I'm resigning from the class because there were three guys that were there as alternates in case one of us had a problem. And so I told I told Jim, this is it, I'm, I'm done, good night. And Jim said, I'm not gonna accept your resignation today. He said, your next class is in two days. I'm gonna accept your res resignation tomorrow if you still want to. And so, so I called my teacher who was in town the next morning, I called him up, Bruce Holzman. And I said, Bruce, could you give me a lesson on how to not get thrown out of my lesson with Segovia? And he came over right away. The first thing he said was, you've got to play Tansman Cavatina. He said, you used to play that during college. Can you learn it again today? And I said, yeah, of course. Cavatina has no fingerings. It was the only publication I, I know of that Segovia didn't have any fingerings in it. And so Bruce said, play this. You can't change his fingerings because there aren't any. And so I did. And and the and the class went great. I played the first. I played the uh, Sarvan, and he just listened. And he and he and he he seemed to like it. And he asked me to play another piece, and so I played another piece. I played the Scherzino, and then he said another thing. And meanwhile, his uh, valet, the guy from his uh, company, from his uh, management company, kept trying to stop him because he would keep the time and he would stop us all at a half hour. And Segovia just kept asking for more and more pieces. And it was really quite moving that, that nobody knows about this part of the class. Everybody just knows about the car crash. But we ended up having a really wonderful lesson at the end. And when I finished, uh, I played the prelude. And when I finished it, doo -doo -doo -doo, bump, 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 he held his hand out. I held my hand out and the audience went crazy. So the, the net result was I went home not hating Segovia and I was much more interested in playing like my teacher had taught me at the beginning, which is very much Segovia-esque. And I still play like Segovia. Well, that's the end of part one. Our conversation with Leona Boyd and Michael Chapdelaine continues on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus to listen. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is brought to you by the team at Acoustic Guitar Magazine. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined for this episode by Blair Jackson. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is directed and edited by Joey Lusterman. Tony Gonzalez is our producer. Executive producers are Lizzie Lusterman and Stephanie Campos Del Broy. Our theme song was composed by Adam Perlmutter and performed for this episode by Jeffrey Pepper Rogers. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to support us, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus or find the link in our show notes for this episode. As a supporter, you'll have access to exclusive bonus episodes along with other special perks. And if you're already a patron, thank you so much for your support.